So like if you overeat, if you drink, if you watch too much porno, if you uh, smoke, like every time you have to go do one of those things or feel the need to do one of those things, you're basically just trying to run away from something that's in front of you. And most likely it's the thing that you need to be facing and sitting still with. But like whatever reason we all run, you know, people run away from certain things. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Lionheart Radio with your host, Rick Alexander. Today, I'm joined by Angelo Cisco. He is an entrepreneur and he's the host of the Alpha Hippie Podcast, a show that I personally had the pleasure of being on uh, very recently. Angelo, thanks for joining me today. Oh, my pleasure, brother. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So, you know, every time I have somebody on, we do this thing. I see, I hear it in podcasts all the time. We're like, okay, let's go back to the beginning. And then we try to start from the beginning of their story and then we go through their entire life. Um, but fuck all that. I want to kind of start with the end because I was talking to you a couple, well, back when I was on your show at the end of it, and we were talking about some of like what your mission is, why you've started the Alpha Hippie podcast, all this stuff. It got me really excited. So what I want to do right now is I want to ask you if you were to die tomorrow and what would you want your legacy to be? If everybody, if you could say right now what you wanted your legacy to be with all the things that you're doing, because you have your hand in so many different pots and it's like, Mm -hmm. I I can tell you're following your passion and you're figuring it out and trying to level up so that you can. So if we could wade through all of it, what do you think you want your legacy to be? First, I want to go on record and saying I love your intensity. Like when you just throw these like things, I get so excited because I feel like that's how I do it to people and it brings my heart so much joy. So (laughs) I just wanted to put that out there. Um, For me, it means a lot to me that people think I'm the truth. I don't want people to think, I don't want people necessarily to like me. I don't want people necessarily to hate me. I just want to be the truth and I want to live my life according to that and I want to help people live a better version of their truth. Whatever it is, is fine with me because I truly believe that everybody deep down, um, their truth is rooted in good. So let's just figure out your truth because I don't think people are put on this earth to be bad. I think people just are programmed to be bad. Interesting. So do you think by you, by your legacy being your truth, by you living your truth, it inspires other people to do the same? I think I have a very outwardly shameless way of living my life. And I think the people that are closest to me for many years have seen that. And now that I've been able to reach and meet more people, I think I, I provide, you know, this is going to sound crazy, but fuck it. Here we go. Oh, sorry. Can I swear? Oh, yeah. Not CNN. Oh, go for it. OK, perfect. So I was in I was in Costa Rica and I spent seven days in, in February. I spent seven days in an eco village living off the land in Costa Rica. It was truly one of the most unbelievable, eye opening, appreciating experiences. We did cacao ceremonies. I did uh a sweat lodge. It was unbelievable. And then at the end of those seven days, you went to the other side, the west side of Costa Rica, and I was at Envision Fest. And uh, I, you know, it was the it was the first night I was going to go out dancing, having some fun. And the first thing I did is I ate like three grams of three to five grams of mushrooms and just went out there. Psilocybin and, uh, or yeah, okay, yeah. And so, and we're there, and uh, I took my best friend with me, who's who's never even been exposed to that spiritual world and uh you know it was it was a gift to have him there and um and i realized like i was in this i was having this moment and just and just sitting there and enjoying it all and i truly believe that what i do is i help people feel safe and i know that that may a lot of people may take that claim but i truly believe in my heart when you're around me or in my my world or in my reach i think i provide a level of safety that um helps people be their deepest truth without feeling shame about it. And I, I really in my heart believe that. And I've met many men that are very um, shut down and masculine or whatever, you know, quote unquote masculine or whatever it is. And I feel like when they get around me, you just can't help but relax a little bit because I'm not all about that that life. And I think it just provides the, a certain truth for people or, or ability to live their truth. Hmm. It's interesting. I think psilocybin is one of the things that has the ability to sort of show people the ultimate reality, like the ultimate truth about themselves, right? Yep. And it sounds like I, that's what you were checking in with. Yeah, I think what it does is it just it cuts through the noise and lets you hear the things that you most likely aren't hearing and also too to be really connected to uh 
you know, I've done I've done ceremonies by myself, but I've also done it with people. And just the level of connection you get when you when you take that when you're with people and you really understand that, like, we're all in this thing together. Yeah, right. So so let me ask you this, then, because you weren't you certainly weren't new to the entrepreneurial game prior to mm-hmm. that. Right. You were already in this world. What um, like what did that cause to, for you to come back and do differently? Like, what have you changed since sort of having that? I guess you could say profound truth. Yeah, for me, it, you know, I, I got to tell you the truth. So I grew up, I grew up in a little town outside of Chicago. My father was in prison from when I was five till I was sixteen. And for me, growing up in my life, the worst thing that you could have ever done was have a job, like, like take orders from somebody. This is like my father's like teaching, and so I've been an entrepreneur most of my life. And um, you know, starting the gym and everything. When I did that, though, I really believe that I did that to. I did that out of ego to to show the world that I wasn't a loser or that I was going to make something of myself. And and I'd be lying, too, if I didn't say that I didn't want to make my daddy proud. And that's why I wanted to do it, too. And um, I believe the, the older I've gotten and over the last like three years, I started to realize that I did do those things for those reasons. But I could change the intention of them now because I realize even what they were. You know, when I was 25 or 26, I didn't realize why I was opening up a gym. I knew I wanted to help people, but I didn't understand the drivers of it, I should say. And now that I've gotten older and become much more aware, I could understand the drivers and I could change the drivers because I know that I have the power to. And then that's what just comes out differently and in, in how I do things, how I approach people. Um, it's it's all it's it from it's from love. Like I never spoke to other CrossFit gym owners for many years. Why? Got it because of competition. That's it. And like right. that's you know what I mean. And now that I look at that now. I want to be like, dude, that you're such a silly kid. Just laugh it off. They're not really going to do that. But like I grew up in a world where I really believe that. And and it wound up being an amazing thing because it did help me succeed. But then it didn't help me get to the next level. And I think um, I bought my head against that many, many times and didn't realize that. I just thought I just had to keep going. And then you realize after you get to point A to point B. But what gets you to C isn't what got you to B. Yeah. So like what got you, you know, here won't get you there sort of idea. So it's interesting. I spent a lot of time looking at behavior of people and what I think drives them. And there are two like very big distinctions and I can tell like your shift and it, you can just talk to somebody and you can tell, but a lot of people live their life as if it's a zero sum game. Right. And so there are winners and for there to be winners, there has to be a loser. And then it seems like now you're sort of of the mentality that, well, no, we could, the, the pie can just get bigger. We don't have to each take our own slice and, and hoard it. We could just make the pie bigger for everybody. Absolutely. I think that's the best way I said. I really believe that at one time. Like if, if somebody opened up a CrossFit gym near me, I was like, I, you know, I wanted to light it on fire. I'd be lying to you, you know? And like now it's just like, dude, there's so many people that we could help. There's so many people that are, are like that. And I think, you know, it's just a difference between scarcity and abundance. Mm-hmm. So, but the interesting thing is, uh, hate can be a really powerful motivator. So like you, you know, putting a chip on your shoulder can be a really, really powerful motivator. Like it's gotten me to a lot of places in my life. Do you believe that you'd still have gotten where you were had it not been for that? No. So you like needed that evolution. I, I do. I, uh, you know, I think it's the hero's journey. It was my hero's journey. And, and I think, um, one day you you you're powerful in, in a certain way, and then you get your butt kicked a little bit, and then you find Excalibur, and then you really realize the truth. Yeah, and that's it. That this was my journey as I grew up. That uh, intimidation and being overly aggressive and just running over people was how you won the game. And then you know it, it worked and it, it served me for many ways, but it also caused me to have a lot of shitty relations. Like I mean, let's just. I mean, great, I won in business, but I, I severed a lot of relationships. You know, I, I was distant from my family because I thought it was a, a distraction. There was a lot of things that I, um, you know, if you look at it from business, I won. But a lot of areas I, I suffered a long time. I didn't do really well with. I was, a, I was a womanizer. You know what I mean? There's a lot of things that, like, come across, come along with that that I think people don't look at as, like, you know, because in, in our culture, we're so versus saying, oh, if you're successful. So if I make money, I, I could be a piece of shit. But in mm-hmm. reality, I think like you got to look at it as there's so many levels to life. And for me, I was winning in the one. And it just so happens that I lived in a, in a country that that was the one that people really put me on a pedestal for. But I mean, if you really had me on trial, I wasn't winning in the game of life. 
Do you think that uh, this moment in Costa Rica, was that like a, oh shit, no, nope, I'm going this way now? Or was this been sort of a gradual evolution? So I'm wondering how people sort of make that evolution. So for people that are listening to this, it's like how, you know, how, if they're trying to get something out of it, how can they? You know what I mean? So I'm curious as to how quick that turnaround was for you. Sure. The, I explained this to somebody else the other day. The universe is nudging you all the time, but you usually don't get, the, you usually don't pay attention to it till it knocks you in the face. And that's, I mean, that's why people have so many, you'll hear about people, I've been on this path, I've been on, and then all of a sudden they have an aha moment and then everything's different. And I think like I was on that path and, and also too, from a self-esteem perspective, you know, it's, I think more people are scared to win big than they're scared to win, uh, to, to lose. And I think that that's a real honest thing. And when you think that like you're put on this earth to have a real big purpose where you're there to help people live their deepest truth, that's a real deep, important thing. And that's not like, oh, great, I'm going to go back to work and we're going to implement this plan. No, like this is something that is needs to be handled with care and it's beautiful and it's you have to be strategic with it because you're sharing a, a special gift and, and you want to share it well. At least I do. And so I think you just you needed that bigger moment to to really appreciate it. And then also, too, for you to get past the idea maybe that that's not you're not meant for that kind of greatness. Yeah. And so you appreciate the sort of profundity and the size of your your why now. Right. Which is it's a very big thing to try to take on. I think it can be helpful a lot of times to think of yourself as two people. I mean, a lot of people talk about your higher self and your your lower self, your ego. And it's almost as if you were directed by your ego for a certain amount of time. And then finally you started like tapping into that, which was much more deeper deepest within you really to sort of find your your ultimate truth which is leading people to there so ironically mm -hmm. now because you know the size of your why do you ever find yourself slipping back into this old mentality do you ever find your e because i mean you know it's it's easy for our ego to be like what are you doing bro like you're gonna look stupid like you're taking something on too big and then all of these insecurities start creeping in and they start taking away you know, that original zeal that you had. Once you had that moment, you get this, you're off, right? You're like, this is my call to adventure. But then life starts setting in and it starts to be like, hey man, what are you doing? You're going to look stupid out there. You know what works. Crush people, do the thing. So how hard has it been for you to not slip back into that old way of thinking? It's a good, it's so amazing that you say that. And, uh, yeah, cause I do. I it. think <laughs> good. Yeah. Cause I think the, the, the universe has a way of, of testing you to see if you really got it. And, uh, I'm not going to lie like I've passed all the tests. So for me, um, I'm – by nature, I think men are here to, to love, teach, and protect. And I try to live in a very chivalry mindset. And so this happened just recently. Like um, my, my wife is my queen. And if you don't treat my wife like she's a queen in front of me, I'd like to end you. And I don't, and that, and that goes from my mother to her mother to anyone on this earth. And I have no limits to this, right? And, you know, I'm I'm so in love with my wife, Rick. And for me, the amount of from how fast I could go to that darkness because I want to just eliminate this threat, it causes that. That was like my. This happened just recently, a month ago. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's it's so it's like realizing that, and then I, and then I and then I I get full of rage, and then. I take a step back and then it takes me a little bit to regain it. But then I'm just like, no, I just want to help them have better behaviors. And that's a better way to teach them. But I, I was taught to use the hammer. It was ingrained in me. And I really believe that we don't, our past, we don't get rid of our past. We build better habits to not repeat it. Mm. But to act like on my tool belt isn't a hammer that I'm ready to hit somebody with, even though now I'm trying to figure out these screwdriver things yeah, yeah. Is, is bullshit. You know what I mean? Like I'm, I have this thing, and it's been a, it's been an ingrained habit in me, and it's like a balance scale. It's gonna take me thirty to forty years of not trying to use it all the time for me to actually not be a part of me. But the that for so for for me, when it comes to my loved ones or family, I think that is still the area, and I think you know anybody I've ever talked to about self development, it's the most fragile area. And so for me, um, there's still it still comes up the most in that I would say, in in my personal relationships and my family, and and also too because they've had thirty almost thirty five years of seeing me in a certain in a certain way, and so I've had to out myself and try to get them to understand that, but. You know, there's certain people that just they're not ready for it to see me how I want to be seen. And I love them and they're still my family. But that's a reality. 
Yeah, and, and that's a really good perspective because sometimes when we start making these changes, the world's not so receptive, right? And so people are like, you know, I've talked about this before, but, you know, the way that people frame the world out, they have to put you in a certain context too and their relationship with all of reality is contingent on their relationship to everything in it. And if you're in it, if you grow, then all of a sudden it makes them uncomfortable because if you're somebody else and they're like, oh, fuck, maybe I mapped the world, maybe I could be somebody else. And that's fucking uncomfortable, right? Because your growth made you uncomfortable, theirs is going to make them uncomfortable, and they might not be willing to face it. So it's interesting that you you bring that up and you're, you're cognizant of it because it might make you, it seems like, at least able to understand a little bit better when you try to change. Sometimes we try to change. Other people don't get it, and we get really frustrated. Like, when it's like, hey, man, well, you've been this for 25 or 30 years, so you need to be easy on yourself when you start falling back into these habits, like you said, you know, start using the tools that you've developed over 25, 30 years, and then everybody else has known you that way too. And so it's, you got to be like realistic about this change process. Absolutely. I think what, what we, people got to realize is, um, you know, you, everybody's under a spell. Like I see you, Rick, as this unbelievable, ambitious, super cool dude that's about to go run 250 miles and write amazing books and change life. Right. And like, let's say one day tomorrow you wanted to not do that for some reason, it would be hard for me not to see you like that. And and that's why like you could totally understand why so many people like redeem or protect other people because they see them through this beautiful lens or a certain lens mm-hmm. and then it's really hard to do it. So for people, it's just understanding that that it takes time for people to be like that. I think I've had a lot of conversations with outing myself for my poor behaviors and ask them for support on helping me be this better version of me. Um and you know, some of the people have, have obliged, some people have disappointed, and that's and that's okay. But like, you know, for me, I'm just trying to put myself around in the best environment that these changes could uh, could stay there. You're all in on these changes, and you're, it seems like you're like all in on your everything, your purpose, your love for your wife. Does that vulnerability scare you? No, I don't. I I think it scares me not to believe that everything could be absolutely a hundred percent awesome. Like I get anxiety, not trying to make every area of my life awesome. Like I don't like the the acceptance of mediocre to me bothers. It, it makes me anxious. Like I could have a conversation with somebody and they'll just be like, "Oh no, it's not a big deal." And I think everything to a point, not everything to a point, but like you should have a hundred percent, or you should be striving for a hundred percent in every area of your life. And that's why I think people need to stop wearing so many fucking hats and realize you're probably going to get to wear, you know, you're going to be a man husband, father, and your career, and then the rest is in the garbage. Stop trying to wear so many more. And so for me, I only try to wear a handful of them, and that's why I want them to be the best pristine hats on the block. Hmm. Earlier, you mentioned as you were going through this process, you, you think the universe sort of tests you to see if you really got it. Do you actually frame it that way? Because a lot of people, I think they make, obviously, they make subconscious decisions and then they look back and they're like, oh, fuck, I've been going down this path for X and I didn't even realize it. Do you frame it like, oh, no, I'm being tested here and I need to make the right decision in order to be cognizant of it? Or or what does that look like? I just picked up on the fact that you said uh, you talked about being tested. Yeah. So two things. One, it helps me be, be aware brings awareness to, to these moments. Mm-hmm. And then also too, it also brings me compassion and forgiveness if I don't if I do not do the right thing. On yourself, with yourself? On myself, yes. It was just a test, no big deal, buddy. There's gonna be more. And then so it's it, it, it's a double-edged sword. It helps me be aware of it, and then I'm human. I, I fuck up all the time. I wish I could carry a journal for people. This would be a seven hour <laughs> pocket. But like, you know what I'm saying? And so yeah. I think it just helps my brain frame it where if something comes up and then my blood starts boiling, instead of me reacting, it gives me a chance to be in that little space between the response going, is this a test? Now, don't get me wrong. Sometimes I I'm, I'm I go lizard brain too fast and I don't have time for that response. And so instead of just sitting in bed all night beating myself up, I, I give myself a little kick in the ass and tell myself that it's a test and I'm going to be better for it next time and to pay attention to it. Hmm. Hey, what, do you th- what has been the biggest challenge since you've sort of been on this newer, you've diverged and sort of gone down this this different path, the, the alpha hippie path, we'll call it? Sure. Um, Where's the resistance at, come? Yeah, sure. So... 
The reason I, I ask is there's so many people like trying to live original lives, trying to figure out what that means. And it seems like you've done a really good job of mapping it out and getting past the insecurities and, and stuff like that. Yeah, thank you. And I, I appreciate that. So here's, here's um, my biggest struggle is having uh, a lot of empathy for, for people that know better that don't do any better. And so I, I have such a hard time. So when somebody along, if I see somebody struggling and they, they could out say what they're doing better, I, it, I, I have to step back and really appreciate, well, what are the reasons that they're not doing better then? And so for me, like just fully understanding people's emotions, I'm a very, uh, I, I, I do. So I was taught this by my, I have a relationship coach now cause I want to be a good father. So me and Rocio have, a, have a calls with, uh, Annie Lala, who's our coach. And the first week of calls, she brought, she broke this down for me and it made complete sense. Um, there's three geniuses. You're a genius in the physical world. You're a genius in the thought world, or you're a genius in the emotional world. Okay. So I am I am a genius in the physical world. I could hammer out to-do lists. I've been up since 4 a.m. I will work to 9 o'clock. I will do things that you could see that that quote-unquote matter. My second my second next to that is thoughts. I love sitting around thinking and, and expanding my brain, okay? But I'm an emotional uh, – I'm a special ed in, in the full, full, full fledge of emotions. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's caused me to have a lot of physical success because I could just shut my feelings off and go, oh, this is what I need to do better. I'm going to go fucking do better. But it just so happens that my wife is the opposite. And that's, and, and that's why you, I fell in love with her because she could feel feelings and she could understand all that stuff. And also, too, it's the same, it's the same token is why I fell in love with her is why I get frustrated with her and other people that, that go in that way in the same way. Sometimes... I just want people to grab their emotions, grab them like they're a paper ball and throw them in the garbage. And we have to take care of things and not that we're going against our feelings or not honoring them. I just think sometimes we just need to do that. But other people need more time to allocate their feelings. And so for me, my my biggest challenge is learning currently that I'm working on is is becoming more compassionate and more empathetic to people that just can't turn it on like that. Because that's, for me, I make a decision and then I make my life, I reflect my life around that decision. And I think for some people, they need to feel more inspiration and that comes over time. And then on top of inspiration, you have to make sure people have enough self-esteem to deserve what they're inspired to become and then they can make the change. And I, so I do it first, I do it the opposite way. So, I mean, I think a shitload of people can, I mean, I can relate to that, right? Like, you know, a lot of people, especially in the quote unquote, like alpha males, like uh, in the community that I come from, special forces community, you, like you just described them to a T, right? Like physical specimen can do anything emotionally really stunted uh, or or cut off, right? And so what does that look like in practice? Is it is it just caught like constant reminding yourself? I mean, is it just trying to be aware of these things? Like how does it, how does one actually change such a thing? So basically what we're describing is the shadow side of the warrior. Sure. So just like we, we could get stuff done, we could take action, but we don't make room for feelings. And then when you look at that, there's a lot of, you know, if you look at the history of warrior, there's a lot of people that have been raped and pillaged and, and there's a negative side to it. And I think that to being a warrior, to being a warrior, to just being all warrior and not exploring your other sides. And so for me, I just try to help when I, when somebody can't get it, I bring that up to myself that I am an emotional, um, spe- I'm a special ed in emotions. And just because I'm great in that. So I try to help, I try to c- c- bring up to my brain my shortcomings. Because when you're in your genius and somebody else doesn't get your genius or get, get there as fast as you can or anything like that, you it's almost a joke to you because it's your genius because this doesn't take any energy for me to be like this. But for me, if you want – so here's a good example. My best man I, – I recently had another wedding ceremony I, at, in St. Lucia with my family. And my best man uh, was uh, was there and I wanted to give him a gift. And he's been my, my friend since – I've known him for over 20 years. And so what I did was is I went to Starbucks on a Sunday afternoon with a bunch of sheets of plain white paper. And I wrote him a letter timelining our relationship and everything now looking back at it as a man with every moment really meant even the moments when I used to pick on him when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And long story short, I was there for 45 minutes. There was at least a pile 
a foot high of napkins for me crying like a fucking sissy, no, boogers everywhere. And then guess what happened? I had to go home and take a nap because I was fucking exhausted because I went that deep into my emotions, mm -hmm. right? And so like for people that are trying to get to this place of like the physical world, you, you may need to under, and I mean, I'm working on understanding that like for them, th that is that much energy. Like I went home and just crashed and it was like noon. I was like, I can't even stay awake anymore. And so I'm just constantly trying to remind myself it's genius for me and it's easy for me, but it might not be their genius just yet. And they may never get to this place of me where they're this productive, but if they're just trying to move a little bit in the right direction, we're, we're doing what we need to do. Yeah, for sure. Do you, has all of this growth, has it, um, you know, I don't believe anybody lives in silos. I believe that we, we sort of, you know, you can't grow as a human and not grow as a business. And we talked all about this a little bit on your sh when I was on your show, but how has this process manifested into your business world? Like, is it as, have you seen as you've grown since this Costa Rican experience? Is that, was that sort of the catalyst for all of this? No, I mean, that was this year. And I would dare to say that like, I've had different levels of spiritual growth and the Costa Rican one right now is is the taking me to where I'm supposed to be right now. I've okay. had a few different experiences and, and everything like that and, and realizations over the years. I've done a few different retreats and stuff like that. And each – I would say once a year, Rick, I get something that helps me level up a little tighter. Okay. And, and has your business shadowed that growth? Has it trended along with it? Yes. Yes. And, and, and the much. thing that the thing that that's I think the most impressive for me, um, the growth of the business is one thing and I, and I love it and I love the opportunity and I love being able to travel when I want and all that stuff. But for more so for me, I'm actually enjoying it and it doesn't feel so hard anymore. Mm. And I think that's like, when you know you're in alignment, right? 100 percent. Like I used to get like migraines or you know what I mean? Like. I, I was telling this to somebody else the other day. It's like think about everything that you do to to run away. The the least amount of things that you have to run away, the more authentic life you're living. So like if you overeat, if you drink, if you watch too much porno, if you uh, smoke, like every time you have to go do one of those things or feel the need to do one of those things, you're basically just trying to run away from something that's in front of you. And most likely it's the thing that you need to be facing and sitting still with. But like whatever reason we all run, you know, people run away from certain things. I, I've abused many different things to, to do that. And so, you know, I'm at a place right now where I'm doing that the least in my life. And that's how I know I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm the most aligned I've ever been. That's a really good point is, you know, it's like we, the, there's so many pacifiers that exist in 2018 for adults to avoid the moment and just sit with themselves in the moment. And so I like that. I've never really thought about it that way, but it's like to the degree in which you were using this, these pacifiers is probably to the degree in which you are enabled to sit with yourself in that moment and face it. Truth. That's awesome. Um, so are you comfortable talking about plant medicines at all? I'll jam on anything you want, buddy. I'm pretty open. Cool. So I've never in so I've never talked to the Lionheart Radio about plant medicines on this show, uh, in large part probably because of my profession. But I am now no longer in said profession, and so I think we can talk about it a little bit. Sure. Um, when you, because I think if we look at you, the, the reason I'm bringing it up, if we look at you and your evolution, you know, I've talked to you a lot about growing up, starting, you know, fathers in prison. You only had the hammer to this point now, where where you're much more open, you're much more accepting of things, and you're much more developed as a human being. What can, And I don't want to be the person that says drugs are the thing that people should do, right? And I, I've always hesitated on whether I should talk about that in this context or not. And so I'm curious with you, what is the role that plant medicines have played in your growth and in this evolutionary process of you as a human? This is a great question, and, and I'm happy to really talk about this. So... Before we go into like the role that they played, I just want the world to know or whoever is listening to the show to know is just basically like this is you know that you're ready for a change before you take the medicine. The medicine doesn't give you the change. Oh, so that's I a don't, great point. And that's that's the one thing I want to say is like I didn't eat mushrooms because it was like cool. Is like I knew that there was something more and right now for whatever reason I needed help and I didn't have the the ability to go there. So I wanted to go there. And so what those these these things do is they just help you go there. But you must know first that you have more potential or there's something blocking you and that there's a reason you're doing them. 
Mm. And I think that that's like the most important thing. And so for me, I, I just knew that there was certain things that I wasn't accessing in myself emotionally and that my hope was by, by trying those and experimenting with them that it would allow me to feel safe enough or maybe even just put my hands down enough that I could feel all of these feelings. And is that what you got from it? Was it, was it what you thought? Yeah. So like, you know, this, you know, I don't want to be all sensitive and vulnerable, like, you know, cry baby, but here's the deal is like, you know, big boys don't cry. Okay. And this is something else that like I grew up in my life is so my father's a beautiful man. And I, this is by no means painting a picture of him not being that because all of these amazing attributes I have, many of them come from directly from him. And I see that now more than ever. But like when we would go to prison visits, my father had this assumption that when we were leaving, that if the prison guards saw me cry, my sister and my mother could cry. But if I cried, that means that they won. So I, I played a game from five years old, even though I wanted to miss my daddy, that I wasn't allowed to cry. So I was programmed to not be allowed to feel all of these feelings. Mm. And, and don't get me wrong, in many instances, and I'm sure for my father in prison, it probably does you well not to feel those feelings. But if you're a seven-year-old, eight-year-old, nine-year-old, 10, like think about these formative years. Yeah. I just blocked it off. Right. And, 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 and so, and I also grew up in an environment that reinforced them being blocked off because you could only guess, where do you think the other kids' dads that I hung out with were? Same prison. prison. Yeah. Like, I mean, this was a nor- this was a very normal thing. So it, it was a behavior that, with this kind of street mentality that was just really reinforced. And so, for me, I just wanted to be able to feel them and not have to feel guilty or like a fucking pussy or a cunt. You know, if I felt them, because that's that's the first thing I think, even when I cry to this day. Yeah. Like that's the automatic thought. It's like. Are you fucking pussy. Right, like right. you know what I mean? Right. right. Like and so for me, I, I wanted to dive into those things in the hope that they would expose me and allow me to be exposed to all of these feelings. It wasn't it wasn't but it was me first consciously knowing that I wanted more and that I was capable of more. Hmm. And, and so that, and then that followed. Go ahead. So did the psilocybin did it help you go back and wade through these sort of earlier experiences and figure out where they were coming from because you know even that you know although now it's like you look at it and you can talk about it and you're like yeah this was a thing that definitely at seven i should have been able to cry but you know and and you can frame it in that context so it's obvious now but <clears throat> us growing up we don't necessarily we we don't think about those things as much right and so right yeah so for me like i had a lot of issues also too with with my mother and that this the my parents were the first place of my healing because obviously I think the majority of us all need to admit that yeah. we're carrying we're carrying around their system right and so um, for many years I did not I mean so between my parents I I had trust issues and I could totally understand now too why for many years I was I was promiscuous and a womanizer whatever you want to call it is I grew up not having full trust in my mother. Simply because I had a father that was verbally abusive and physically abusive, but didn't, um, but my mother didn't defend me. So she watched it happen. Mm -hmm. So it was her witnessing it that, believe it or not, gave me more trust issues than my father being the way he was. And so I grew up with a resentment to my mother for not being there. And I... I went. I was in Encinitas, California, in Mike Bledsoe's house. It was me and a shaman, and I really, it, for real, it was. Just, it was a one day. And it was beautiful. It was just me and him in there, and we, we, you know, I journaled about these things and I spoke with him about these things. This wasn't like this was a very intentional thing for me. Like I don't do these things. Like I said, like I do them for answers. I don't do them just just because. And so As pacifiers, right? Because that's right. what a lot of people do. For sure. Yeah. Like like we talked about, like doing that is no different than the guy that goes for a drink at the bar. They're really in the same neighborhood. But yep. if you if you have a true purpose for it. Yeah, intention. Um, yeah. And so like I realized that, man, my mother's this beautiful, loving woman that loves her family unconditionally, but she didn't have the self-esteem to stand up for me. She can't even stand up for herself. So how is she ever going to stand up for me? And then I grew this unbelievable amount of compassion for my mother. And now when I see her, I see her as this beautiful woman 
with a little girl inside of her that doesn't know how to stand up for herself. So why am I going to keep kicking her in the head now that I know that she's a little girl and she couldn't have done it for herself, let alone for her babies? And she wishes she could, but that she doesn't have she didn't have the capacity at that time. And that was one of my biggest my biggest awakenings, my first ones. It was it was brilliant. It, it, and then I realized all the amazing things that she did teach me. And one of the biggest things that she did teach me was how to love and 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 create family and community. And no wonder I have a CrossFit gym that is a is a beautiful community because my mother instilled that in me. But I was too worried about why she didn't make sure that uh, that I felt good in 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 that sense during those uh, harder moments with my father. Yeah, and and you know if you. And I appreciate you being, you know, truthful, which I guess that's your legacy. So, I, but I appreciate you being so truthful in the show. And, but if you think about it, you know, like one of the things that I, that would be really hard to replicate is all of the deep work that you just talked about. I mean, you're talking about thousands of years of talk therapy in order to try to get to that, to get to that point. Right. And that's what I think the beauty of some of these plant medicines is. I, that that's so perfect that you said that. I've been a therapist. I've done a lot of things like that, and all those kind of things. And um, I think it just it just drills you to the center of your heart, and the center of who you really are, and not with any noise around it and any judgments around it. And it just lets you feel that and see it. And then you come back to the regular world, and now you really know what's deep in there versus where you might have not thought it or you everything like that it just just gets you to your core and that's where i think it just helps you reach it that a lot of things just can't yeah i i agree and i would say to piggyback on what you're saying like one one other thing that i think is really quality about uh some of these plant medicines is that you have this experience you have this conversation with your higher self or or you come to these realizations but then you feel them going forward. Like it, they get instilled. It's almost a rewiring process. And they get instilled within you. It's not It's not like when you get drunk or and you might have fun, you might laugh, you might whatever, but then that night's gone and then that moment's gone and it's just something that may or may not have happened. This is like, oh no, I actually remember what it was like to feel those things and I can still apply them going forward. Absolutely. And I think you know, uh, a second to that is um... – you know, through breathing, breath work and stuff like that. And even just like being in tune to them, you could feel those feelings again. Mm. Like it's not like you can't recreate, like once you felt them, you yeah. could recreate, you could recreate them and you, cause you know how to tap into it now. So it's not like, like I said to you before, it's, it's not like this abusive thing where you're doing it all the time. It's like you do it, you get to like, let's say you're at level 10 in the video game, you get to level 11, you live life at level 11 and now it's time to go to level 12 and you just use it as like this tuning fork to keep you on, on the true path that you're supposed to be on and not the one that this world is trying to push you to. Yeah. Yeah. I was listening to a psychologist talk about a study on psilocybin. And he talked about the fact that it changes you in actual degrees of openness and openness is a trait that within entrepreneurship is actually shown to be very beneficial. Now there's a lot of places in the world, wall street where openness wouldn't, it wouldn't help you at all as far as whatever that metric of success looks like. But when we're talking about life, we're talking about quality of life, we're talking about entrepreneurship and some of these things, um, you know, it actually changes your degree of openness going forward, which can be really, really important. Yeah, I, I think, you know, before any lens you want to put anything through is I just want to be an amazing man. I, I every other title is, is great, and yeah. but every other title comes second to that. And how do you judge that? You know, for me, it's a feeling. I have a, I have some core values that I really believe in, and, and certain things that I run my through certain filters I run my life through. And uh, if it's aligned with those filters, it's a yes. And if it's not, it's a no. So go. So that's some of some of the stuff going past, and that's what's going on with you in the present. What What are you most excited about? About like what's going on with you? What's going on with your community? Like kind of looking forward. Sure. Um, so right now with. So this this evolution of Alpha Hippie, and uh, I haven't felt like I've been on a ride in in life since I first started training people outside in parks. To where like this, it's so that was about nine years ago. It's it's a very parallel feeling um, right now. What what Alpha Hippie is? Um, it started as just like this fun little hobby thing, and then it's it's growing into something that um, I feel like is happening through me, not. Uh, 
Like I just, it, 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 the, the things just pop into my brain. And so Alpha Hippie, I first just made this logo because I couldn't find a shirt that said Alpha Hippie and I thought I was an Alpha Hippie. Hmm. And then and like a weirdo, I copyrighted it and I was like, man, I'm not going to print out one shirt. I'm going to print out 100 shirts. And I just started handing them out to people. And then I was like, man, what can we do to continue this this idea of Alpha Hippie? And I'm like, man, I want to have amazing conversations with people. I selfishly just want to learn from them. I'm going to hit record so if anybody else wants to learn with us, they could join the party. And I started thinking about what what gets me the most rageful in my life. And right now, believe it or not, what makes me the most rageful is when I see a man not living a purposeful life. I uh, the the true uh, like you could totally understand why we're animals if you find that thing that makes you the most rageful like as humans like you could totally get why we're not far from gorillas right, right. Uh, um, and so it makes me so upset um, with when I see a man not living in integrity not doing what they say they're going to do not just like doing things to make them proud and mm-hmm. accepting less of themselves it really makes me it makes me so rageful and so like usually my first response for many years was I to bully to bully a man that wasn't like that um which I mean is is very natural if you look at nature but you know we're humans too so what what could be better and I was like man what if I created a course that basically reflected all of my growth and the things that I'm doing on a daily basis to to help me live a more authentic life. And so, this week we uh, this week we launched the beta group of Alpha Hippie Masculine Mastery. And along, so I have the podcast, but along with the podcast, I just started this course. I haven't really done much promotion. It's only been through a few phone calls and some crazy people that were happy to do this thing with me. And so. Uh, I just got done this week with the first call, and it's it's just a ten week course that I've put together to help men live a more purposeful life, and and the practices that we need to do uh, to keep us in the position to live our best life. I think that's where people miss it. Is okay, so you find out what you really want, you find out what you're about, but now you need to put your body, your mind, your spirituality, and your emotions in the best position so you could you could uphold those values all the time. And so that's what the course is about. It's about finding out those things and it's about finding out where we're living congruent in our life to those things. And it's about finding out where we're not living congruent to our life as well and what we're going to do to have those hard conversations and, and, and make those changes. And we're going to have a support, you know, a support system for men to be able to do that. And then also the practices um, to to make a difference and, and make sure people are taking care of themselves. You know, the most uh, the most popular email that I get on the show is, um, and actually mostly men, it does seem like, but are, are they shoot me an email and they say like nothing's, and I bring this up on the show because I I get it really a lot, like weekly almost nothing's really wrong, but nothing's really right. And, and, and what's interesting is you, you talk about these purposeless men, but they're so, but the, the reality is nobody's taught to find their purpose. Like that's not even, you're taught to be a cog in society. You are not taught to fucking find an authentic life. And then, so it's like, where, where do people, and we'll talk, we'll plug the course and stuff for sure. But just for the sake of the conversation, like where, I mean, where do you, where do you start with that? Yeah. So this is, this is a really good point. So I, I, I've been doing a lot of research and studying on this and many thousand years ago, societies had ways for boys to go to men and knew with a set of principles and values like very similar, like what people see with like the Spartan and stuff like that. That happened in many cultures a long time ago. Mm-hmm. Like it was like, these are the principles that we're going to live by and you're going to go with other men and you're going to get some hardships and you're going to get kicked in the ass. You're going to get taken away from your mama because now you need support to teach you how to look to, to live for your, your strongest and best self. And that only comes from men helping other men. That doesn't come from women helping men. Nothing against women. But their love is a short-term Band-Aid love. Like my mother, if I was sad, she'd go and let's say I, was, I wasn't living to my truest self, she'd make me a big plate of food and rub my head. But what, what I really would need is you to call me up and, and, and slap me and tell me to be the best version of myself because the world's counting on me. Yeah, that's fucking really well said. And so what, what I would like this course to become is just a, a way to help people get out of boy psychology and into men's psychology and what that really means and all the, the beautiful parts of it and also understanding the shadow parts of it because most of us are just either living in a shadow of boy psychology or a shadow of ma- males, men's psychology. And we need to realize that 
I really think we're all kings and we could all be kings, but we need to help each other be kings. We can't hate each other to be kings. Yeah, that's a that's a wild thought that that so many cultures before us had this rite of passage that is actually completely gone and would be ridiculous if you tr- like people would be like, that's ridiculous. Right. But it, so many cultures had it before us. Right. And uh, and so what we're doing right now is we're living a principalist society and we're expecting men to step up. And meanwhile, men have taken their time to abuse certain certain things like um, like I truly this might be a, a political tangent or whatever. But I think the reason that feminism and all this stuff that's going on, this Me Too, is because we didn't do what the fuck we were supposed to do. We abused it. And we and now we didn't out ourselves for being abusive. We just try to not act like we didn't do it. But plenty of men fucked up. And we have to admit that we abuse power with women mm-hmm. and that we, we're going to do our best to restore it now. And then I feel like women need to appreciate any mistakes that they made. And I think as a culture, we would just be masculine and feminine energy. We would be dancing with each other and that women lead the species. We, we lead the society and we would be good. We would be beautiful. We'd be in harmony. What do you mean by, by women lead the species and, and men lead the society? Without without seeming like a chauvinist, I just really believe that women are they 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 help with family, they create families, they 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 handle the emotional side of things. But as far as like carrying like empires and things like that, just history has shown that it is a more masculine energy trait, and that's what I'm getting at too. So if there's feminine, if there's women that have a lot of masculine energy, I'm not saying that you can't have that, but I believe that a lot of women have taken on masculine energy simply because they've had to because we've done a a poor job of keeping them safe and making them feel like they could trust us. Mm. These feel like unpopular opinions in 2018. I I I want to I want to just say that if it's unpopular it might be but it's not because of my lack of wanting it to be better. It's my understanding that both sides need to say that they did something poorly and and both promise that we're going to we're going to stop hitting each other over the head. We're just going to try to be better. Yeah, no, and I think that's well said. I mean, and and to your point, I mean, whatever the narrative is right now, it doesn't seem to be working so well. And and so since you've come out with these messages and this sort of this passion and this, these ideas, have you found that it's resonating with men? Yeah, I, I had a like just even on my first call, I, I was explaining these things to people. And a lot of times men just It almost slaps them in the face that they're like, shit, I really don't have any core values. I have no idea what the fuck I even stand for. Right. Or or if I do, I stand for someone else's core values that they gave me. And I think it's a very popular thing for people. And and I really took this. uh, This is kind of funny. But one day I was I was taking a a sauna with a friend of mine and we were just sitting there and I go, you want to know something? Life is the business of yourself. And if we were starting a business, we'd have mission and core values and we would run a company aligned to that. But we don't run ourselves aligned to that. And then we wonder why we're not aligned to anything and we're all over the place. And once you write your true, you understand your true core values and they're authentic to you and they're in the words that you understand them, you live your life through that filter. And I think you live a much more authentic life versus not. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. In uh, The War of Art, the book by Stephen Pressfield, one of the things he talks about is running your yourself, your personal life, as if it were a business. And, um, you know, it, it would help you not be so damn sloppy in your personal life, right? Because you have values that you have to adhere to. You have a mission that you have to get done. Uh, and so thinking about it in that context can be really productive, I think. Yeah, I, I, it was so, so funny. I came up with it one day and I go, man, I'm out of something. It really made sense. It just hit me like... You know, it just you run it through there. And if you ever run a big company, you don't sweat the small stuff as long as your mission's going the right way. And I think it's a beautiful way to live your life. Yeah, I completely agree. How can people get that course, by the way? Okay, so this may sound like I'm not a really good entrepreneur, but I I have no true plan for it just yet. If you'd like more information on the course, you could message us on uh, Instagram at the Alpha Hippie and uh my the email is the alpha hippie at gmail.com like i said i'm in i'm just finishing up week one of the beta group and uh you know i'm sure i'm going to go back to the drawing board on a few things before we finish out these 10 weeks and i and i do another beta group but i want to feel like we have a really good recipe and so if you that's basically where i'm at right now is still in the stages of developing this but like i said to you before i think i'm really on to something uh that this is where people are at and i want to help make people better
Yeah, get me in on that second group. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> All right, so we didn't talk. There are a lot of things that we didn't talk about in your, you know, in your past and and, and even in your business life and what you're doing because you are coaching individual CrossFit athletes. You're consulting with gyms. You're you're doing coaching calls. You have a lot of entrepreneurial endeavors on the side. Plus, you have the Alpha Hippie thing, which is sort of what we focus on today. Yes. So if you could take all of these things that you've done, all of the growth that you've had, all of the, the lessons, and you could boil them down, you were given a microphone for, for one second, and you were able to say something that everybody in the world would hear. It would be translated to every language. You could give advice. Everybody would hear it. What would you tell people? And it can be on entrepreneurship. It can be on life. It can be on growth. It can be on whatever you, you think is important for people to hear. Wow, this is such a this is such an amazing question. Um, you know, it's easier said than done, but I think you need to find out who you are and spread the rest and spend the rest of your life sharing it with the world. And and for me, like I believe I'm a teacher, and so. You named all those things that I do, but every single one of those things is a lens of a teacher. Mm. But and it, so, it, go ahead. It's just so hard for people to, you just made the distinction of the things that you do and who you are. It's so, so damn hard for people to find out who they are without wrapping their identity in the things that they do. Mm -hmm. So how, how do you, be, how have you begin separating that process? For me, I think people need to take a real account of what gives them energy. What gives them energy? What would you do for free? And what are you curious about? Hmm. And I think if you really made a list of those things, you would find certain themes in all of them that would make sense. And like I said, like I'm a teacher. So every endeavor that I take on is through a lens of me being a student because that's the, that's the first part of being a teacher and then me sharing what I learned. And so all of these things that I do, I have the gym and I have, I, I, there's, I, there's everything that goes into owning a CrossFit gym. I have a nutrition coaching company that goes into everything that's mentoring a beautiful young entrepreneur that basically does the, that basically is the engine of it. Um, you know, there's my business coaching, which basically I just teach these entrepreneurs how to be authentic and the rest of it takes care of itself. I'm not a tactics person. I don't know how to do Facebook ads. I've never done a Facebook ad. I'll never do one. Hmm. Um, because those are, the, I believe, the things that I teach are the hardest, they're the nonlinear, but they're the thing that's the biggest lever. So I focus on that. And so, like you said, like I coach CrossFit Games athletes, I'm more of a, of a guru in your brain than I am in program design. I think it's all pretty much the same, but I definitely think how I could get you to see yourself and talk to yourself in the middle of a workout is the difference between it all. For people that are listening to this, I think one of the things to pay attention to is the fact that your ideas appear to be so well thought out. And so sometimes, you know, there's there's a lot of people that exist in the fitness space that they don't know dick. They're not original. They're essentially just copying everybody else that they see. And one of the things, just, just as a speculation, just from talking to you for 50 minutes, for people that are listening to this, one of the reasons, in my opinion, that people should follow along with you, listen to your show, jump into that course. The reason I want to jump into that course is because when, you know, when you're asked a question, you don't recite an answer that's been recited a million times. You're like, no, no. So I've looked back at history. This is what I've noticed. These are the trends. And so somebody that's so well thought out in their ideas typically has a lot to offer the world. So I really appreciate you taking your time and sharing those ideas with us today. No, it was my pleasure, man. I love you and I'll definitely let you know about the course and whatever I could do to support you and any of your listeners in any way. I mean, even if you're a listener and you're listening to this and you just have a quick question, shoot me an email. It's not about money. It's just about help and support. So just let me know if there's something I could do to support any of your fans or like I said, listeners, if you need some love, just let me know. Dope. And where the, where's the best place for people to follow along with you and support what you're doing? Um, so right now there's the alpha hippie on Instagram. And then what we recently did is we made the alpha hippie tribe, which is a closed group, um, just for people that are a fan of the show and fan of what we're doing. And I post questions in there and videos and content. And there's other, some thought leaders like yourself that are in there that are there to support. So any of those two places. And like I said, that email, the alpha hippie at gmail.com, it goes right to me. I'd happy, be happy to answer anything I could do to help anyone. Awesome, man. I appreciate you taking the time. Oh, my pleasure, brother. Cool. Thanks, guys. 
Thanks for listening to Lionheart Radio. I hope that the information from today's show will make you fitter, happier, and healthier. For the show notes of this episode and every episode, head to www.lionheartrad.io. Yep, just like Lionheart Radio. And please, if you have the time, head over to iTunes and give us a five-star rating. It really helps us to know that we're on the right track in delivering you reliable information and value. As always, feedback is welcome. If you have any comments on the show or like to suggest a guest, send me an email at rick at louisvive.com. That's L-U-A-V-I-V-E. Dot com. Thanks for your support, yeah. and we will see you next time. <laughs> Bitch, I feel good. Don't I look stupendous? My shine is so endless, and shit you can do to end this. Even when I'm dead, niggas still gon' bump that chip shit. Coke, white, escalate on cinches for you dipshit. So you won't forget this. Midwest, nigga, be the coldest. Cleveland, it's-